You know, I think we're all pretty angry about something right now because, well, shit, if you're even remotely paying attention, you can find something out there to be angry about. The advisory committee. All right, let me get the fuck out of here. And I tend to do this, I swear to God. I, I tend to not really pay too much attention to anything on Twitter. You know, I might read an article or something now and then. But what I used to use this platform for was to like watch cat videos, you know, cats just running face first into a pane of glass and knocking themselves out or dogs running full speed into toddlers. And I'd walk away from that experience and I, I get a little chuckle in my heart and a good feeling. But what is that place like lately? Lately? It's become a terrible place and I artificially limit how much time I actually spend there because I don't want to have a heart attack. Are you forcing your officers to set the vaccine, to get the vaccine? Uh, as I said, no, I'm not. There are entire groups of employees that are willing to be fired and laid off. I don't want to be in a position to lose 5-10% of my workforce overnight. He should be removed immediately! <laughs> well, that might be how many people are threatening to quit, but how many actually would? Um... My Twitter wall went from being nothing but like cats and dogs doing stupid things to people getting shot or people refusing a shot because of microchips. Yeah, you know, as if you're not carrying a GPS tracker and surveillance device right in your pocket willingly. And I'll get enraged and I'll go share an article and my follower percentage will drop a fraction of a percent. And that's how things are, you know. Bye. Bye. But those people that walk away, they'll walk away with a bad feeling in their heart, you know, because this person that they used to like, you know, has an opinion that they don't like. And, and I'll feel bad about that because honestly, that's kind of who I am. I'm kind of a pussy. I'm not gonna lie, a little bit. So whenever I'm streaming, uh, I'll inevitably get some guy who says, oh, you know, I, I really want to like this game, because, but the developers lied during development, or uh, the, it's these SJW cucks who developed this game, and I'll stop and I'll think to myself, holy shit, is he right? You know, this is, I am getting distinct SJW vibes here. Like, what? maybe this game was developed by SJW cucks. I mean, look at that girl's hair. She looks a lot like a softball coach. I mean, fuck this game, right? And I get to thinking, like, maybe, like, if nobody got up in the morning, turned on their webcam, sat down in their nice deluxe gamer chair, and spoke those words thusly into their Yeti Blue USB microphone, if anyone would have noticed any of this shit at all. It's like a chicken or the egg kind of thing, right? Like, did angry game reviewers give birth to the angry game fan, or did angry game fans give birth to the angry game reviewer? Yeah? But I got a better question. How many licks does it take to get to the fudge center of my asshole? I think we're all maybe just a little too angry right now, and I think that what we all need right now is just a break from all the negativity. All right, so I want you to do me a favor. I want you to look into this cat's eyes, and I want you to say, do I want to disappoint Mr. Mittens? Ask yourself that question honestly. If the answer is no, then continue watching. As I spend the next 20 minutes rimming the asshole with six games that I really like in 2021. Let's dig in, pussies. Nineteen seventy one. We woke up in a different world where the Cold War ended along with the Vietnam carnage. All because of the dome. The dome. A territory full of anomalous artifacts, phenomena, and organisms. In case this is probably the least appealing name for a game I've ever heard, and it's not just because I have dreams of being buried alive every night. I've been seeing this game pop up on my Steam Recommends since it released, and every time I saw it, I was like, okay, but nah. Like, maybe some other time. If this was called Wasteland Retard Simulator, I probably would have picked this motherfucker up immediately. In case says it's a tactical sci-fi RPG set in an alternative 1970s where an enormous and inexplicable artifact, the Dome, is discovered in a remote desert. 
fight enemies. Explore the anomalous wasteland, level up your character. They actually thought to put in this little tiny description where you have basically no real estate. They, they thought to put, you can level up your character. <gasps> really? Join one of the forces in the ruined world. And then the description just ends. Now, many people have compared this game to Stalker because of the anomalies and things like that. And then other people compare it to like Fallout or the Wasteland series. But this game is actually, at least as far as the story is concerned with the dome and everything and all the alien technology, this game is more like Rosewater. I know that's a really obscure book, but it's a book about an alien dome that appears and... Anyway, pedantic thing aside, this game is really not any of those things, and I really don't understand how a marketing department can screw up this badly. Katarzyna, marketing lady, I need you to listen to me, okay, and I need you to listen good. This game is not about the story, it's about the simulation, you understand? Hey, here, look, I'm gonna write your tagline while I write my own video because I'm such a nice guy with such a sunny disposition. Have you ever dreamed of playing a character with crippling anxiety who never talks or allows himself to be seen by another living person? Have you ever wanted to play a pacifist playthrough but you're not into all that pussy shit like turn the other cheek and you'd rather ram your fist through that cheek until the problem goes to sleep? Have you ever wanted to play a character who has functionally the same level of intelligence as you? You fucking idiot! <laughs> Have you ever wanted to just kill everyone and let God sort it out? Well, don't rush out to buy ammo just yet. Buy Encased. It's the game for you. Encased is a breath of fresh air. I've done a few runs with a bunch of different characters and by far, the most fun I had was with a mentally handicapped character. It was funny watching the writers do somersaults trying to explain how this recessive gene pool manages to live through every single encounter. You could do things like open the door of the descending space elevator and get everyone sucked out and thrown to their deaths in the very first minute of the game. Does Fallout let you do that? Once you beat the two to three hour tutorial, the game opens up into a nice little open world, but don't expect stellar writing. That's not why we're playing this game. We play it to fuck around with it. There's four or so achievements for playing the game a certain way. There might be more, but these are the ones that I know about. You beat the game by not speaking to a single person. You do this by finding ways through areas using sneak and your criminal pass to break and enter, hack and proceed. It requires a well-rounded character who diversifies their skills and knows the game like the back of their hand. Then there's the pacifist run where you go through the entire game without killing anyone. That one is facilitated as a system where melee weapons including hand to hand only render the enemy unconscious where they'll stay for years. Then there's the achievement for killing every last person you see in the wasteland. Just go on a murdering spree and be hated by every person that you've met. Until you kill them, that is. And then they don't hate anybody because they're dead. Then there's play styles like being a scientist. It feels much different than like a psionicist or a firearm style. It has a lot more diversity in play. It also does this thing where the game kills you in dialogues or dialogue cutscenes. It doesn't get in your way though, you know, because the game normally saves right before dialogues. So it doesn't set back your progress or anything. So it doesn't get in the way because honestly, and that's a good thing because honestly, like, the best part about this game is finding out all the different stupid ways that you can get yourself killed. Legitimately. It's a strange profession. Game deck. You're neither a player, nor a detective. You know the rules and how people break them. How they leave a digital trail. This is my story. What's yours? Game Deck. A game that sounds more like a peripheral that you play a game on than an actual game. The description on Steam says that it's a single player cyberpunk isometric RPG. You are a game detective. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
It's hard to take that seriously. Who solves crimes inside virtual worlds. Use your wits to gather info from your witnesses and suspects, getting to the bottom of deceptive schemes. The game continually adapts to your decisions and never judges. But is it those things? Is it cyberpunk? Nah, it doesn't have enough punk. Plenty of cyber, nowhere near enough punk. I've heard people compare it to Disco Elysium. Is it? No, it can't possibly hope to compete with the narrative structure there. Eh, the writing, man. I, You know, I don't apologize for anything that I say here, usually, on purpose, but I am going to apologize for this because I know how bad it feels to get criticized for writing. God damn, in the first three hours of this game, I was fucking bored. At least I thought that until I started associating my character with his favorite attribute, which is the infotainer. It's sort of like a YouTube personality. And as I continued, I realized that it absolutely was this game's intention to make me personally feel bad when all the infotainer options were vapid and self-absorbed. The game put me into this uncomfortable situation where I had to like reconcile some things about myself, you know, inside, you know, because it's like I couldn't disagree with what it was saying. I know it's true. It's just not fun to hear out loud, man. So the game does this thing that I've never seen a game do before, and that's really capture a personality. Like, this game's detective default personality appears to be this vapid, big-headed guy who has a really high opinion of himself and what he does. Because the first mission has really high stakes. You see, it has a kid who snuck into a sex simulation, and he's got a hard-on that might kill him. I mean, you can't start the game with the funniest mission if the rest of the game is going to get so serious. It's weird because in a strange way, this game manages to create actual human stakes out of the world of video games. It does this by repurposing the lore of internet gaming history, warts and all. It takes topics like microtransactions and manages to drill down on that subject to a point where you can feasibly see the human cost of it, and actually manage to have stakes at the end. And a bittersweet good ending. It's, damn. Way to set the mood. And the mechanics are also unique, especially the system that handles how you progress through a case. It's confusing at first, but once you see there's two ways to progress a case through dialogue and by menu, then you can start jumping to conclusions because nothing ever seems fair and it, I keep wondering if I got railroaded or if I didn't do a better job keeping my secrets to myself. I've got to be honest, my first few hours with the game were not favorable. But after my failure of the first mission and the realization that this studio actually did what it said it was going to do, I mean, I think that that's kind of a miracle in and of itself, isn't it? I hope that if I do a video on this one in the future that the game does in fact show me a different side of the events and that my results will be different instead of too slight to notice. So I failed the first mission. Uh, this guy, he, he hires you to break his kid out of a murder porn simulation. And instead of doing that, what I actually did was I, uh, I gave the kid brain damage and uh, the other girl's in a coma. So yeah, that didn't go as planned. <laughs> and it would be nice to know you can screw things up that badly, and the game is just like, that. Eh, live with it, because you only get five save slots, baby. Save scumming is possible, but really hard when small things you do early in-game can knock you out of choices later. I really need to play this game more for a review. So, let's make that happen. <laughs> What I think this game does really well is allow the player to trust their instincts and believe about the case what they want to believe instead of being forced down a narrow funnel. Uh, you can jump to a conclusion and then follow that conclusion to its inevitable conclusion. Basically, if you weren't paying much attention to the way a person was speaking, you might have spent several hours chasing the wrong clues to the wrong person. But in the end, it always leads you to a decision. That decision does most of the heavy lifting as to whether you did the right thing up to now. And your past decisions can also come up to bite you in the ass as well. And the thing that I haven't mentioned that a lot of these games do really well is that they show you the numbers, sort of. Like whenever a past decision you've made affects the story, it tells you. This happened because you were playing solitaire on your employer's secretary's computer. The UI in this game is a little confusing and doesn't show enough information about virtually anything and you know what you know it's really hard not to complain you know i have all these complaints and instead of letting them out i have to like push them down inside of me this, this is not easy for me the game takes place in several other games and there's this farm simulator game that is a piss take on the free to play games and and I, i'm not happy to admit this but it got me it really did <laughs> i mean 
I spent enough time in this place grinding out the pumpkin farming and the berry farming and then and at the end of the day my farm looked pretty damn good man i had all the cosmetics couldn't get any more than that now look at that shit i got the shiny tools the stage coach i got a little cactus there i have some rocks and uh this grave i guess has some guy in it i don't know why i'd want that and this is the best thing a cow skull or I, I don't actually know what animal that comes from but i do know one thing i know that when people come to my farm to visit they won't just be thinking i'm some guy who just sits on his ass and does nothing for a living this is one of the best games on the list for sure what Brigand Oaxaca, a game birthed from the mind of an insane person who spent all of his time developing the game high on angel dust, ramming his head through the drywall while singing its hip to be square from Huey Lewis on the news. This game is not about the pleasures of conformity. It has a style that is at times baffling while also being satisfying as hell if you let it be. I've seen JRPG elements blended into survival game elements and just mixed up with these Insim flavors. And it's all in service to create this brown mush of shit that when you don't look at it and you just eat it you're like damn this is pretty damn tasty this game also doesn't give a shit about trends it seems to delight in breaking them and it might throw you off here and there with some non-streamlined decisions but that's all the charm in this game it's like the designer is making a personal statement about the mindset of only making a game when you're high as fuck hey paul this game has all those little things that keep bringing me back, like for instance, at the first point in the game you have a decision to make. Help the guy who used to come into your room at night and blow in your ear, or help the old guy with the voodoo powers. Depending on who you help, you get faction reputation. There's voodoo in place of magic, and a training system that requires you to find certain people in the game to train you. And that lends a bit more importance to the exploration side of the game. Laughing Coyote is helmed by Brian Lancaster, and the tagline on his Twitter is, Makes games that are hard, you will die a lot, and you will like it. And that actually sounds like the commands of a woman who's dressed in full body latex currently stepping on your nuts. And stepping on your nuts this game will do. And the only safe word is all that for. I've actually gotten stuck a few times on one area simply because my build sucked and I sucked and I couldn't get over to suck. But it's still installed on my computer and I'll still start new games with it hoping to get over that hump. If you're looking for the equivalent of an FPS M-Sim under rail, then this game just might be for you. Wait, hang on, what is that? Shit, I'd smash. I mean, as long as she like, chokes me out with them legs, man. That shit would be hot, bro. Yeah. You know, one day I was looking through my Steam recommends and I come across Kingdom Come Deliverance and I'm thinking to myself, hey, that's a cool game, I might play it, but I found out that I only had like 40 hours in the game, which is a shame. But if you remember correctly, when this game came out, it famously shit its pants publicly. And that's because players couldn't figure out how to take the protagonist's clothes off. This is a game that died because it was too different. But what does the Steam page say that it is? Kingdom Come Deliverance is a story-driven open-world RPG that immerses you in an epic adventure in the Holy Roman Empire. Avenge your parents' death as you battle invading forces, go on game-changing quests, and make influential choices. Well, yeah, apparently it is all those things. And all the things that you do in the game actually do affect things. Decide to be a good little toady and do everything you're told, or be a murdering highwayman who only serves the Lord so he can get away with killing people. Now, you might be looking at this footage and you might be thinking to yourself, wow, holy shit, does it really look like that? No. It mostly looks like this. But sometimes it looks like this. The 
combat and the road to being good at the combat is not only a journey for your character, it's also a journey for you. Because if the blacksmith's son gets better at it, you're getting better at it as well. Because it takes Henry a really long time to learn anything thanks to his disability. And after you do finally get good after grinding out all that EXP in the arena with Sir Melon Bash, you'll feel like a god with a sword until you meet your first bandit camp. Like, other RPGs simulate a lot of things, or try to, but that's mostly with the combat and it's usually with numbers. Everything else is rather restricted feeling in terms of story and how you complete story objectives, but this game, with a few exceptions with insta-fail missions, this game gives you a ton of freedom. If it is anything, it's an immersive sim RPG, and I'm always surprised when I come back to the game and discover something else I didn't know about it. Because a lot of it's fairly cryptic, like how do I level up pickpocket? By pickpocketing, dummy. But how do you do that? Figure out this minigame. Okay, how do I sneak? By doing this. Then there's the story, and the story is a little slice of awesome, you know? Tales of drunken priests with their floppy dicks poking around in local girls' holes. Then there's this tale of this lady, and she's married to a duke or something, or a lord, and she must be bored out of her fucking mind, because she keeps coming into your room at night to tuck you in like the world's creepiest mom, and you think to yourself, wow, she might pop a titty out, and you get excited until you find out that the titty is for feeding, not for sucking. Yeah, he may have a castle, and people call him my lord all the time. And yeah, he's rich, and he's powerful, but I remember when we were younger, and someone would call him my lord, and he'd give me a look, and he'd take me from behind into some bar in a private place, and give me a good old rogering. But now, his sails have fallen, and our relationship is just floating by. As is more beauty. Oh, Henry, do me, do me right here. Do me like you do your milkmaids, Henry. That storyline, it exists. And honestly, I, um, I really didn't even exaggerate it that much. If you like really good games, then you'll probably like this game, but don't expect it to open its legs on a first date. It's waiting for a truly dedicated stud to get in there and really work for it. You know that nightmare where you're trapped in your office building and you can't find your way out? You know? And maybe your legs don't work, you can't get out of your seat, or you're walking around and every time you turn a corner it ends up being the place where you just were? Like you're trapped in some kind of non-Euclidean office entity? That's happening because your job is secretly crushing your soul and wringing out every last drop of what makes you you until you are a compliant and obedient office boy. And what you really want is to just break free, pursue your life's dreams and goals, but life is just a series of, of financial roadblocks that impede progress and stymie your creativity. Infra is that game. Infra is a weird game. It's like I kept expecting a monster to pop out at some point and it never did. And because it never did, there was always this tension lurking in the background, like this can't be it. And honestly, it's a hard game to recommend based on that premise. So what does Steam say this game is? Infra puts you into the boots of a structural analyst on a routine mission. Quickly though, your task turns into a fight for survival, all caused by deep-rooted schemes of the past. Your tools are simple your camera, and the wits to navigate a labyrinth of debris. In reality, you don't do much anything, honestly. You might solve a puzzle here and there, and aside from that, the game is a lot of exploring and investigation, something that it never really feels like you're supposed to be investigating. It has this urban exploration feel, like I used to get... Alright, you know what? It's story time, kids. Pull up a chair and listen. Back when Daddy Paul used to live in California, I used to do photography, and that is until I started having to compete for jobs with guys like my cousin-in-law's brother. I had almost given up on photography, but then my friend came and got me one day and said, let's go on a field trip. But for some reason this field trip needed a field generator and lights. What we were actually doing was breaking into an old abandoned oil refinery so we could take pictures of, as Jerdog said it, Jerdog was like my, you know, pet name for him. 
Also, he didn't know I called him that. Anyway, he says to me, we're gonna go take some pictures of this weird guy I know. An inauspicious start to a very suspicious day. Anyway, we get into the car and there's this guy and he's sitting in the back seat and he keeps saying something. I can't quite make out what it is, but he keeps saying it in this very exaggerated voice, right? And which wasn't exaggerated for him because of course it was his voice. Then at the photo shoot, he just kept saying gobble gobble every time I walked past him in that voice while staring like aggressively in my eyes. I'm just sitting there wondering, does this guy want to fuck or fight me? Like, either way, weird mating ritual. And I went to Jaredog and I said, hey man, like, uh, dude, what the fuck is wrong with your friend? And he just looks at me and says, I don't know, man, he's just like that. Like what, I'm thinking? Fucking insane? Does he just sit around all day hallucinating that he's a fucking wild turkey singing gobble gobble all fucking night? Or does he want to lift me over his head like a flag and, and drink the shit out of my ass like a wide mouth beer? What does he want? So long story short, every time this game makes me uncomfortable, it's actually because I'm remembering that man saying gobble gobble over and over. Gobble gobble. The point is, the game captures that feeling of going to an unknown, possibly dangerous place in search of cool things to look at and take pictures of. A world in decay can be just as beautiful as a pristine one, albeit in its own ways. You go to these places in search of experiences you just don't get in normal everyday life. You also get to be ground level, see how our world works, instead of just read about it. Sure, we get the overview in school, we know dams exist and what they're used for, but we never get to see inside one, or see a falling apart one, and get to see all the little ways in which infrastructure collapses when the right amount of money isn't spent maintaining it, and what happens when it all falls apart. So uh, yeah, invest in infra. If you like puzzles, and you like ambiance, and urban exploring, or perhaps you just want a very relaxing and hypnotic experience to sit down with and simply enjoy, without any stress or adrenaline, then this game is for you. Now I think I might have saved the best for last. A thousand years have passed since the Cataclysm. The Manakalan Empire, all but forgotten. This name, Salasta, every time I saw the name, I thought for a split second that the game was a space sim. No thanks, and I just kept on scrolling a lot before actually stopping to buy it. What does the Steam page say this game is? Roll for initiative, take attacks of opportunity, manage player locations, and the verticality of the battle in this turn-based tactical RPG based on the SRD 5.1 rule set. In Celasta, you make choices. Dice decide your destiny. Yeah, okay, I guess it is all those things, but you know what else might have been important to put in the description? Yeah, it's a tool. It's a game. It's a tabletop game to play with your friends. It's a whole goddamn thing. Celasta is a tactical RPG. The combat has a very XCOM kind of feel to it. There's cover, which grants you a defense bonus to ranged attacks. And if you don't use it, chances are you'll be peppered by arrows and all sorts of ranged attacks. You can move boxes and obstacles with a shove, which I can see being used in all kinds of ways. In fact, even early on in the game, you show that knocking over debris can sometimes one-shot a whole group of enemies. The movement system is super satisfying because unlike a game like Pathfinder, this game is actually truly grid based. Your characters move in and out of combat on a grid so there's never any question as to whether or not you know you're close enough to an enemy to hit them, you always know. I love it. It is not multiplayer. I was really bummed to see this because, well, they translated the 5e rule set so well and everything in this game is screaming for multiplayer. I mean. Just look at how dialogue plays out here. You have four characters and each one has their own lines that they could say, which are derived from a personality that you craft, which is derived from backgrounds on the alignment chart. So sometimes they might say something lawful, but other times they might be callous. So it looks like they're trying to emulate the whole tabletop experience here in single player by not having you focus on dialogue on one character, but instead giving each character a time to shine. The game already feels like a multiplayer game, 
and if it had a multiplayer feature i mean any multiplayer feature of any kind i think that the dungeon maker feature in the game would get a hell of a lot more attention because this game this game right here this thing is so close to being a complete replacement for neverwinter nights for me because i still play that game to host my tabletop sessions i mean celasta could take the place of neverwinter nights in my whole routine you know it could be a tool for tabletop sessions Celasta, so if it had multiplayer in my eyes, would replace that game forever. It just needs multiplayer and a dungeon master tool. So yeah, find a couple million dollars laying around and make that happen, okay? Cool, thanks. Now, I've heard there's a feature hidden somewhere deep in Steam that allows you to invite other people to play your game. I've never used it. If that thing exists, it strikes me that this could be a very cool feature. Now, about the game, the battle system is intriguing. There's a lot to it, and I feel like I've barely scratched the surface. Like, okay, I don't know how to properly address this, but here goes. You know how Dungeon Masters are different? Well, there's good ones, and there's bad ones, and there's all kinds of reasons for that divide, but even more interesting is the divide between a good Dungeon Master and a great one. And it has nothing to do with their ability to act or do funny voices. Celasta, in this example, is a great Dungeon Master, and Baldur's Gate 3 is a good Dungeon Master. How to explain this? There's a rule in 5e that a lot of people who run games don't really take into consideration fully, and that's sight. Yeah, being able to see things. I've never actually seen a CRPG do it. Like, okay, here's the thing. You know, torches have been lately given some kind of uses, you know? Like, if a dungeon is too dark and you're walking around without light, you might run into a trap and get yourself killed. But before in games, it was just like, you can't see in the dungeon, so you can't move around inside the dungeon, you had to use it. And then after that, torches had absolutely no use. They were just like, completely cosmetic. And then we started giving them uses again. Torches help you see people who are hiding. That's a useful feature. But what happens when you're fighting in complete darkness and none of you have a torch or dark vision? Well, most video games don't care about that. Celasta does, and Celasta confirms upon you disadvantage on all ranged attacks. Guess what previously useless spell suddenly gains uses? Fairy Fire, for example, becomes an incredible tool. Guiding Bolt becomes a spell that has endless usefulness. Torches are a must-have, and spells that cause blindness are a must-pick. And that's why, so far at least, Celasta is a better dungeon master because it manages to immerse you into its combat so that you treat those scenarios like puzzles. That's the kind of thing that 5e really excels at. Encounters as puzzles. A much more full experience rises from this interplay of mechanics and it brings the player one abstraction layer closer to the characters in the game. I loved every minute of the combat, even the parts that had me confused because I took for granted that there was no way the game was taking combat this seriously and never imagined that torches would be this useful in a fight. Yeah, well, I never had to fight dark vision lizard men in a pitch black cave before. Oh yeah, and they can crawl up walls and attack you from there. But it's okay, so can you. This is a fantastic combat simulator, but do not expect more than this. I'm gonna put it to you this way. If the people who developed this game do not find a way to allow players to set up private servers for the game and allow people to use editing tools in the combat system in their own tabletop sessions, well, they're missing a great opportunity, goddammit. Like seriously, somebody give these fine people millions of dollars so that they could put in a multiplayer feature because not since Neverwinter Nights have I felt this sort of excitement for a game that I could possibly be playing with my friends online. I mean, let's make it happen, guys. Let's make it happen. And playing Invisible Jones. <laughs> Ask her how come she looks like a human, but she's called like a birdie. Tell her you want to be a hippie with a hippie name like her, but you don't know how to go about it. Ah, uh, it's very commendable and not difficult at all. First, you should believe in peace and love for the world. You do stand against the war, right? Well, yes, war is it cool? You're for peace and everything. <laughs> uh, Krishna Swami claps his hands. Now we can invent a hippie name for you. Uh, you know what? You know what? I'm gonna go with uh, I'm gonna go with Love Unicorn. I don't know. It just it kind of speaks to me.
That's a bit cliche, but uh, I like it. Vote <laughs> for Superstar Cop. <laughs> It does remind me a lot of fucking Disco Elysium right now, but like, uh, uh, more, you know what I mean? And so I officially pronounce you a hippie. You may commence not cutting your hair. Uh, point at the beads. Cool stuff, in it. <laughs> Do you like it? I made it from some forefather thingies. I bought them from some local guy. Well, that guy who sits near the gas station. Mmm. Uh, uh, ask her how she come she looks like a human, but she's called like a birdie. Hippies are perplexed. Give a mysterious grunt. That is her spirit animal. She has a tattoo as well. Show it, Swallow. Yes, show me your tattoo, lady. Shadow lifts her shirt as if it was perfectly an ordinary request. Of course she's not wearing a bra. Fuck yeah, baby. A rather crooked tattoo of a bird spreads its wings above her left nipple. Nice. Nice. How's that? <laughs> Shit! Yes! <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Dude. Dude. The, 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 Option one and three are both the best things I've ever seen. They're both the best fucking things I've ever seen. You can shout admiringly, titties! Or you go, ew, gross! Cover your face and <laughs> your hands and run away. Oh, man. No, no, you know I'm not going to pick three. You know I'm going to shout titties. Come on, man. You know I'm gonna shout titties. You don't know it. If you don't know me by now, <laughs> you are never gonna know me. They both laugh. I think our new friend likes it. The girl moves her eyebrows saucily. Mm. 